Dear friends, welcome to the show, Talk with your doc. I am Dr. Prashant Jani and with us is today Dr. Juma. Uh, she is an obstetrician and gynecologist at Thunder Bay Regional Health Science Center in Thunder Bay, Ontario, Canada. Today we are going to talk about cervical cancer. Cervical cancer is one of the most common cancer in women and it is not only in America but all over the world cervical cancer incidence is high. And cervical cancer is one cancer where if you don't diagnose it and treat it at earlier stage, it can lead to death. However, there are certain modalities where by which you can diagnose and treat and even prevent it. So Dr. Juma is going to guide us today about how to diagnose, how to prevent and how to treat a cervical cancer. Thank you Dr. Juma for coming to the show. Thank you for having me Dr. Jani. Please tell us uh, about incidence of cervical cancer in your practice. How common it is? So cervical cancer uh, thankfully is quite a rare diagnosis amongst the patients that I see. I do see a lot of women who have abnormal pap tests who are at risk for developing cervical cancer. Um, but we know that the number of women who get diagnosed each year isn't very high. Um, but it is a cancer of young women which makes it especially concerning. So we need to be extra uh, careful in terms of screening and preventing it uh, so that we have fewer women uh, diagnosed with cervical cancer. So in the last 30-40 years do you think the mortality of cervical cancer has gone down or maybe reduced by 50 percent or less? Absolutely. The um, incidence of cervical cancer has decreased significantly uh, since pap screening was introduced almost uh, just over 50 years ago. So at that time, um, you know, there would be thousands of women who were diagnosed with cervical cancer each year. Right now in Canada, about 600 women are diagnosed each year with cervical cancer and 150 women um, pass away because of cervical cancer. And we've had such a significant improvement because of pap screening and the ability to de detect cervical cancer early. So what do you think are the risk factors for cervical cancer? So the biggest risk factor for cervical cancer is um, getting the HPV uh, virus, human papilloma virus. It's a sexually transmitted virus, but it's unlike other sexually transmitted infections in that everybody gets it when, you're, when you become sexually active. As women, when we're young, which is under the age of 25 for our cervix, we're oftentimes able to clear the infection on our own and we don't need to do anything more about it. So it's your immunity which clears the infection? Absolutely. Your body's own immune system is able to get rid of the infection. So one can get infection at earlier age, but it is cured by our self-defense. Exactly. But if, unfortunately, your body isn't able to cure it, then it has the ability to uh, infect cells in the cervix and that infection can then turn to abnormal cells that could lead to cervical cancer. So um, how does one get this HPV or H human papilloma virus infection? So human papilloma virus is um, present on our skin surfaces. There's many, many different types. There are types that can affect the skin on the hands and the feet, and those are plantar warts and palmar warts. And there are different types that can cause genital warts on the outside of the skin. Um, and then there are types that can cause uh, cervical cancer as well. And we call those types high-risk HPV. And it's just through sexual contact that we get uh, this high-risk HPV. So it is normally present on the skin, you mean to say? Yes, it is. Okay, and then one gets transmitted from one person to another by the... With sexual contact. Okay. It's different than other sexually transmitted infections in that everybody gets it over their lifetime okay. uh, through sexual contact. And we're oftentimes, like I said, able to clear that infection. Uh, there isn't a treatment for it, but we can prevent it um, uh, and we can make sure that we deal with the infection if it's present. I've heard that this HPV can cause in addition to cervical cancer, other cancers of the body. So can you please tell us about something? That yes, absolutely. So HPV is a risk factor for other cancers, oftentimes cancers of the mouth and the throat. It's also related to cancers of the, the anus and the rectum as well. Those are the most common areas that HPV can also cause cancer in addition to the cervix. So how does that also uh, virus is transmitted there? Like is it through sexual contact or through 
food particles or how does that happen? So that can be transmitted through sexual contact or through touch um, from skin to skin surfaces. So um, are there any particular type of HPV which is more uh, high risk than the other types of HPV? Absolutely, there are some types that are more concerning than others. We know that HPV 16 and 18 um, are implicated in about 70% of cervical cancers. There are another five types of HPV that are responsible for about 90% of cervical cancers. So everybody who gets affected with HPV will not get a cancer necessarily? Right? Absolutely not. Um, we know that um, we're all exposed to HPV, uh, but only about 5% of women have an abnormal pap test, meaning that they've been exposed to an HPV type mm -hmm. that may cause changes on their cervix. So it's a very small number of women who are exposed who then can develop problems from HPV. For the majority of women, our immune system is enough to uh, prevent us from having any problems with HPV. So uh, is there any uh, way how we can prevent the HPV infection? Yes, there is. Uh, we're very lucky that uh, there is a vaccine now that can help prevent um, acquiring these harmful types of HPV that can cause cervical cancer. So please tell us about this vaccine. So the vaccine is available for men and women as part of a school-based program, and it's usually administered in grade seven, uh, and children at that age receive two doses of the vaccine. The vaccine can prevent up to 90% of cervical cancers and 90% of genital warts um, in men and women. So it's called HPV vaccine? The vaccine is called the Gardasil vaccine, Gardasil. but it's, we just call it the HPV vaccine. So is it like an injection? It is. It's an injection that we usually give in the upper arm. Um, and it's the side effects are minimal. Sometimes you can get some pain or redness in the mm -hmm. area, mm -hmm. uh, just like with any vaccine. Um, but there aren't any uh, long-term side effects or, or adverse uh, reactions that have been noted. So I, I was informed that there are three doses of vaccine to be given. Is that or there are? That's a very great uh, question. So in young people under the age of 15, they only need two doses of the vaccine. Over the age of 15, men and women require three doses of the vaccine. Okay, so as you said, it is a part of the school program now. It is part of the school-based program. Um, children do need consent from their parents to receive the vaccine. If they miss getting it in grade seven, they're able to uh, still receive the vaccine through a catch-up program through public health. Okay, so once one takes the vaccine, like two doses or three doses, mm -hmm. does it provide lifelong immunity or one has to take a booster dose? Uh, once you get the full course of the vaccine, um, it does provide lifelong immunity. We still do recommend screening though for women uh, with pap tests to see um, if there's a development of cervical cancer because it's not 100%, just 90% of cervical cancers. So it's still important to get your pap screening after that. We'll take a short break and we'll continue the discussion on vaccine after the break. Thank you. Please stay back for the next part. Welcome back to the show, Talk With Your Doc. Today, Dr. Juma is with us and she is talking to us about cervical cancer, how to prevent it. Thank you, Dr. Juma. You were mentioning about the HPV vaccine and the three doses and it can prevent lifelong immunity, but we need still the screening after that. Now, uh, how often one has to take these three doses? Every six months or every second mm -hmm. month or how does that happen? So the screening schedule for the vaccine um, is different if you're younger, so uh, under the age of 15 or over the age of 15. So in the school-based program, children re will receive the vaccine today and then in six months time. Okay. For people over the age of 15 who are receiving the vaccine, they would get a dose today in two months and then six months from today okay. in order to get the best protection from the vaccine. Okay, so uh, with this vaccine, we can protect ourselves from the cancers, right? Mm -hmm. So it is very important everybody should take the vaccine. It is very important. Uh, it does protect against 90% of cervical cancer. The vaccine also protects against genital warts and that's 90% of genital warts. 
So we know in countries like Australia, where they've used the vaccine for a longer time than we have here, they've virtually eliminated genital warts in young women under the age of 30, which is fantastic. Uh, and they're also seeing reduced rates of cervical cancer in that population. So, you know, over the next 10 years or so, or so we hope that we can see those same um, dramatic decreases in genital warts and cervical cancer here as well. In my practice also, I see a lot of oral cancers nowadays related with HPV. And I think this HPV vaccination will reduce those cancers as well as, right? It has the opportunity to reduce um, cancers in the oral, uh, the oral cavity, the esophagus, the rectal area as well. So um, we can see in time what effect that has, but that would be definitely a very significant advantage to the vaccine as well if it uh, covers those areas too. So everybody should get vaccinated. <laughs> yes. Now, um, to prevent the HPV infection, uh, one is vaccination. Mm -hmm. How about the healthy living or healthy lifestyle? That's a very good question. So we know one of the things that can really affect our body's ability to deal with the HPV, vaccine, uh, HPV infection, aside from vaccination, is smoking. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's one of the things that we can modify in our lifestyle um, is to either reduce smoking or quit smoking if we are a smoker. We know that definitely um, helps our body deal with HPV infection. For women who have HPV infection, who have changes on their cervix that could lead to cervical cancer, we know that if they reduce the amount of smoking, the amount they smoke or quit smoking altogether, their body has a better chance of fighting off the infection. It has a better chance of responding to treatment to mm -hmm. an infection that's already there. Um, and if they unfortunately were to develop cancer, they're more likely to respond to treatment uh, for cancer as well. So re no smoking is good for... Uh, yes. <laughs> So, um, uh, sexual activity, how, mm -hmm. uh, sexual partners, multiple sexual partners, mm -hmm. or early sexual activity, early age mm -hmm. activity, do you think that is a risk factor for HPV infection? It's a risk factor for exposure to the HPV virus, yes. um, but it's less of a risk factor for infection. Okay. It's really how our body deals with uh, the exposure to the virus that um, uh, is the responsible for our risk for developing an infection and um, cervical dysplasia and cervical cancer. And definitely, if we minimize our exposure, mm -hmm. uh, that's important. Um, using condoms can be uh, helpful in that respect, but they, it, condoms don't provide full protection from HPV in the way it does for some other sexually transmitted infections. So uh, healthy living is very important component there. Absolutely. Now, uh, tell us something about the pap smear testing because that is one of the key uh, tests which can prevent the cervical cancer. That's right. So pap screening has been around for a long time and it's responsible for such a dramatic decrease in the rate of cervical cancer that we've seen uh, in Canada and around the world where there are pap screening programs. And what pap screening does is it looks for cells that have been affected by HPV. Mm -hmm. And by screening for those cells, we're able to identify women who already have changes on their cervix that could lead to a cervical cancer. And by identifying them early, we're able to treat them and prevent cervical cancer from developing in the so first So pap smear place. detects the HPV infection at earlier stage. That's right. right. Now, what are the mm, pr protocols for pap smear testing? At what stage or age one should start doing the test? So if a woman has had any sexual contact, um, we recommend starting screening at age 21. Mm -hmm. If your pap test is normal, then you should have that repeated every three years until the age of 70. If you've had normal pap tests in the 10 years prior to the age of 70, then you can stop screening at that point. Now, um, some, some uh, who have family history of cervical cancer, uh, what is the uh, indication of pap testing for them? Do you have to do go for earlier age or at the same age? So with a family history of cervical cancer, we still recommend screening by the same routine as everyone else because uh, cervical cancer we know is caused pr primarily by HPV infection. Mm -hmm. Is there any genetic component to cervical cancer? 
Not really. Mm -hmm. um, not in the same way that you hear about breast cancer and things like that. But definitely, uh, we do inherit our immune system from our, our parents. And so if uh, your parents aren't able to deal with the HPV uh, virus effectively and they've developed cervical cancer, then your immune system may not be able to deal with the virus as effectively either. Uh, and so definitely you should have screening. We don't recommend it increased screening interval, um, just the same routine screening. Considering getting the HPV vaccine would be another option. So pap smear has been there for a long time, like maybe 50 years or more. Mm -hmm. But uh, not all the women uh, undergo pap smear testing, like even in Canada or in America, developed countries as well. So what do you think is the reason? So a lot of women are afraid of getting a pap test or they don't want to get a pap test because it's uncomfortable, um, which I completely agree. It's, it's uh, quite an invasive test because we have to do a speculum exam. So a lot of women are shy um, or uh, concerned about it or afraid or afraid that if they get the test that it'll find that they have cancer. Um, so we really encourage women to see their primary care provider, whether that be their family doctor, or the nurse practitioner, the um, screening bus is also available to do pap testing, to get that pap test on a regular basis. Uh, because we know that in women who are screened regularly, the detection of cervical cancer is quite low. Women who haven't had a pap test for 10 years are the highest risk group for finding cervical cancer. So it's very important every woman gets this pap testing done. Absolutely. I know it's uncomfortable and it's a little bit awkward and women can be shy about having a test in that area, but it is really important in terms of preventing cervical cancer. And it's available at every family doctor clinic probably? Yes. All family doctors should provide um, routine pap screening. Nurse practitioner-led clinics also provide that screening. You can get it done at the public health unit and also on the, the screening bus. And it's a very short duration test, right? How long it takes to do a pap test? It takes only about five minutes. Five minutes of time, but mm -hmm. it can prevent your whole life from yes. the cancer. Yes, definitely. It's a short test. It's a little bit uncomfortable, but it can prevent cervical cancer, um, and it's very effective at doing that. So, you know, if you have questions about it, make sure you talk to your family doctor, your nurse practitioner, um, and, uh, and get screened. Get the pap smear done. We'll take a short break, and we'll continue with the last part of the cervical cancer screening. Thank you. Welcome back to the show, Talk With Your Doc. Dr. Juma is with us today and she is guiding us about the cervical cancer. Dr. Juma, you were mentioning about uh, pap testing and uh, it is very, very important for every woman to undergo pap test. Now, suppose a pap test comes positive, what uh, happens next? That's a very good question. So, um, we know amongst women who do get screened with pap tests, only about 5% are positive. Uh, so that means the majority of women uh, have a negative pap test and just need to have one repeated in three 95 years. 95% are negative. 95% are negative. Those 5% of women who have an abnormal pap test, sometimes it can show low grade changes. If that's the case, we recommend repeating the pap test in six months. Okay. And that would be done with your family doctor or nurse practitioner. If the pap test shows high grade changes or that repeat pap test with low grade changes is positive again, mm -hmm. then you'd be referred to the colposcopy clinic. Okay, so uh, once you uh, come positive, then you have to come back again. Otherwise you come back every year. After every that. three years. Every three years after that. Yeah. So uh, low grade, you are referred for the second pap test and then you go to colposcopy. What about the high grade? The high grade, you're referred directly to the colposcopy clinic because we want to see you right away. A high grade pap test or high grade dysplasia is concerning for HPV infection uh, that could progress on to cervical cancer. Mm -hmm. So we want to make sure that we're taking a better look at the cervix to see if there really are abnormal cells there or not. Because a pap test is just a screen. It's not 100%. We need to do uh, something more like a biopsy to actually diagnose if there are changes there. So when you say low grade, which means low risk of transmitting to the cancer, and the high grade means higher risk of getting to the cancer. That's right. right? So high grade is uh, followed directly to colposcopy, and you do biopsy there? What do you do further? 
So in colposcopy, it's very similar to a pap test in terms of what happens. The difference is that I look at the cervix through a microscope and I put a special solution on the cervix that makes abnormal cells turn bright white so mm -hmm. I can see them. If I see those abnormal cells there, then I take a biopsy. The biopsy is looked at under a microscope again and it can tell me, you know, is there a concern for changes in HPV infection with a high risk HPV or not? Mm -hmm. So is this biopsy uncomfortable procedure? You know what, usually it's not too bad. Um, it's very quick. Women usually feel a little bit of pressure or a pinch, but it's usually not painful. No pain, pain at all. Do you need anesthesia for that? We do put a little bit of local freezing in the area just to make women more comfortable. Um, and after that, after we do the biopsy, we put a little pressure on the cervix and women go home and can uh, go on with the rest of their day as usual. Yeah. Now, uh, about the pap testing and pregnancy, we forgot to ask the question on that. Mm -hmm. that. Do we do the pap testing during the pregnancy period? We used to do pap testing with women during their pregnancy routinely. Now we only recommend screening women in pregnancy if they're due for their pap test at that time. Okay. And then suppose that test comes as a high grade, for example, then what do you do further? So if a woman has a high grade pap test in pregnancy, we would still see her in the colposcopy clinic and I would still look at her cervix and put the special solution on. But oftentimes I don't biopsy the cervix then. I wait till after she's had her pregnancy. baby mm -hmm. and then bring her back at that time. So once you biopsy, um, you do the biopsy and biopsy also comes as positive with mm -hmm. a high grade dysplasia, then what is the next procedure? Right, so after we biopsy the cervix and it comes back positive for high grade dysplasia, which is concerning for development of cervical cancer if we left it alone, mm -hmm. we would recommend treating the cervix. And there are two ways that we can treat the cervix. We can either use a laser and just burn the surface of the cervix to remove those cells, or we can do a LEAP procedure, which is a larger biopsy of the cervix to remove those infected cells on the cervix. So after doing the laser surgery or LEAP procedure, uh, is the dysplasia cured or do you have to follow up again? So we hope by treating the cervix in that way that we are able to remove all of the HPV infection and cure the women of that HPV infection. Um, but we do still follow up because we want to make sure that that's the case. So usually after treat, treating the cervix, I see the woman in six months mm -hmm. and then a year and one more year after that mm -hmm. uh, to ensure that that infection has cleared entirely before she can return to regular screening. And the biopsy which comes as a low grade, what do you do with them? So with low grade um, biopsies, we usually follow them uh, and then we can do HPV DNA testing as well. Tell us about this HPV DNA testing, what it is? So HPV DNA testing is looking for the actual virus that can cause these changes on the cervix. And what we're looking to see there is, does a woman have an infection with high risk HPV, the type that can cause cervical cancer or not? Okay. If she doesn't have high risk HPV, her risk of developing cervical cancer is very, very low and she can return to routine screening every three years. So how do you do this HPV DNA testing? What sort of sample is collected? So we can either do the HPV DNA testing on a routine pap sample, mm -hmm. or we can do it as a swab that goes off to the lab. They look at it, tell us if there's high risk HPV DNA present or not, and then we can talk about that with the woman. Okay, so just by the swab, uh, the, and the swab is sent to the lab. Do the patient have to pay for it or is it covered by the OHIP? <laughs> so um, right now, HPV DNA testing is um, not covered by OHIP, mm -hmm. so a woman would have to pay for it uh, herself. The provincial government is looking at funding HPV DNA testing uh, and they've approved funding. It's just not part of OHIP right now. Hopefully that will be coming soon and then women won't have to pay for the test. So how much is the cost at this time? The cost varies between about 50 to $100 for the HPV DNA test. But that is only to be done if you have low grade on the biopsy, is that right? We recommend right now um, doing HPV DNA testing if women are over the age of 30 and they have a particular type of low grade pap test called 
abnormal squamous cells of undetermined significance or ASCIS. Mm -hmm. In those situations, we recommend doing the HPV DNA test uh, because oftentimes those pap tests are, show nothing at all. Okay. It's just a false positive. We also recommend doing the HPV DNA testing as part of the colposcopy clinic mm -hmm. when women are being treated to see if they've cleared their infection after treatment. Okay, so how long it takes for the result of HPV DNA to come back? Usually it comes back anywhere between two weeks to six weeks. Okay, so it can help you to diagnose whether it is low risk or high risk. And if it is high risk on HPV DNA, what do you do? Yeah. If they have high risk HPV DNA and their pap test is normal, then we recommend screening every year rather than every three, three years. years. So frequent screening. Frequent screening. screening. And if they're um, if their pap test is abnormal and they have high risk HPV, then they need to be seen in the colposcopy clinic right away. Thank you, Dr. Juma. That was a lot of information for us, but I think it is very inform important to diagnose through the uh, HPV testing at earlier stage, repeated pap smear and this HPV DNA testing. That helps a lot. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Thank you everyone for being part of the show.